welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for this week's edition of the Neurobioimaging Virtual Pub. Um, we'll start the pub with a, a quick announcement um, regarding an upcoming pub session and I'll hand over to uh, my colleague Claudia for the announcement. Claudia, please. Yes, thank you, Johanna. So um, I'm Claudia Pfander, I'm the coordinator of the Eurobioimaging Industry Board, and I want to alert you all to an opportunity to present your own work in the virtual pub in the form of uh, flash presentations. We have decided to arrange a special edition uh, to also mark our more than one year anniversary of the virtual pub, um, a session on speed in biological and biomedical imaging which will take place in April on the 16th. And we are currently uh, looking for abstracts to present. If you move on to the next slide. So uh, what are we looking for? We, we asked you to tell us about your experience with the uh, challenges you have experienced in relation to speed, uh, about the fastest technology that you have used, the fastest imaging application, imaging processing, or also the fastest processes, biological processes that you have measured. And uh, to encourage you to participate, we also will uh, vote um, for the best presentation at the end and hand out a prize uh, to the best academic presentation. Industry partners are also encouraged to submit abstracts and briefly present uh, some of their solutions. And um, we hope to have an exciting session on that occasion. So if you just click <laughs> once more, Johanna, please submit your abstracts fast and uh, we hope to see you in that session and that you um, submit plenty of abstracts so it will get an exciting event. Thanks, Johanna. Thanks, Claudia. Okay, then with that, um, we are ready for um, starting the, the actual event for today. So, um, I just want to point out that if you are joining us today for the first time and you would be like to be added to our mailing list to find out about future occurrences of the virtual pub and the topics there, uh, please put your email into the chat or you can just send it directly to me via the Zoom chat and we'll add you to our mailing list. And we'll also be recording today's meeting. Um, and so if you don't want to be recorded, please make sure to turn off your cameras. And with that, I'm very happy to um, introduce um, Ricardo Enriquez, uh, who will be our speaker for today. And um, a brief introduction. So Ricardo has a background in software engineering and physics. And then he actually worked as an imaging facility manager and software developer before doing his PhD in biophysics and cell biology at the University of Lisbon. After a postdoc at the Institut Pasteur in Paris, um, Ricardo um, was a group leader at the MRC Laboratory for Molecular Cell Biology and a professor at the University College London. And he very recently um, moved his lab to the Gobankian Institute in Lisbon, Portugal. Um, the, the lab focuses on addressing biological and biomedical questions using optical microscopy tools um, that range from, uh, that they are working on developing, and that range from developing new probes to software and hardware solutions. And we're very inter uh, interested to hear um, the presentation today on open cutting edge super resolution and machine learning technology for studying cell biology and viral infections. So all of the topics that we are at the moment um, interested in globally. Please take it away, Ricardo. All right, thank you so much, Joanna. Um, so I, hi everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to present you my 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 work. Um, pretty much everything I'm hoping to show you today is completely accessible. What I mean by that is, uh, if it's based on software, it's immediately available to you. It's free. It's open source. If it's hardware, it's really meant to be uh, extremely easy to replicate and for you to apply in your lab. So, so keep in mind that what you are seeing in practice, you can immediately apply it to, to do your research wherever you are in the world. So I always like to start my presentations by telling you a little bit about uh, uh, this funny experiment. Uh, because the thing is, I can actually backtrace exactly the moments that I decided to become uh, a research uh, scientist. And it boils down to, to this experiment I was asked to do when I was 15 or so. Um, 
And, and I was uh, visiting a university with a laser lab and there was simply the, the question of, here's a laser beam, here's a switch. What do you think is going to happen? Um, and so, all right, I was a kid, I, I knew very little, but I knew a few things. At the time I knew that light was composed by photons. I thought of them as ping pong balls. So I, I, I thought, well, there's this flux of ping pong balls that are going to go in a direction. There's this barrier in between. So I think some of the ping pong balls will come out of the hole. Uh, some of them were going to collide against the size of it and either will be reflected or absorbed, but they will not pass through. Uh, so this was my hypothesis, right? I think I'm going to get a shorter beam out of that slit. And what I saw blew my mind. It was exactly the opposite to, to what I was thinking. And, and here's the movie of it, right? So two boids, we're going to close them off. There's the laser beam uh, going through the boid uh, on the upper part. And as we close them off, what happens is exactly the opposite to what I was expecting. You actually see this beam elongating sideways. There's these side wolves appearing. And, you know, it's it's mind-blowing. It's exactly the opposite of what I was expecting. And in my mind, this was the first time I was seeing, you know, magic to a level that I couldn't really explain. And this was so disruptive in when I saw it that I pretty much decided to, exp to spend my entire life studying it. And now if you think a little bit about what happens on a microscope, every molecule that you try to see, it's kind of a point source of light at the end of the day. And the first thing that that point of source of light is going to find is the aperture of your objective. And that aperture obeys exactly the same physical principles as you saw before in the slit, except that instead of being a 1D slit, as you saw, you actually now have a circular slit. And because you have a circular slit, you have this elongation that is actually radially symmetric instead of being in a single axis with all the side lobes that you saw before. And that's what gives rise to a PSF on a microscope, right? But also that the diffractions, which gives rise to the PSF, also imposes a resolution limits that you have in the microscope. Because every point source of light will have that huge pattern, which prevents you from distinguishing patterns that are very close to each other. So, so in practice, this is what you get, right? When you go to a microscope and try to see a, an object that is really small, like a mitochondria, what you're seeing there, uh, you really won't resolve much of its structure um, or, or much detail uh, on the object itself because it's it's something that is really small within the cell and there's a limit to the resolution that you can get on the conventional microscope. And you all know that we found tricks to bypass this, right? So the, the One of my favorite methods uh, to bypass uh, this problem is actually um, localization microscopy, where what we do is we reduce the information contents that you have in each individual image to make it easier to understand what you have there. So effectively on super resolution localization microscopy, what you do is you decorate your sample with a photo switch wall for force in, and in a light mediated manner, you're able to switch off all the flow force that exists uh, in your sample and just allow a very small subset of them to actually actively emit light. And because this is such a small subset, you can actually see them as individual molecules and even detect and localize them with very high accuracy. What do you do after? You switch off that, uh, uh, those flow force that are acti actively emitting and let another random uh, um, number of uh, flow force to actively emit again. And what happens is that now the information that you get in each image is so simple that you can detect and localize the vast majority of molecules that actually compose your sample to a level where you can create a super resolution reconstruction, which has much higher resolution than your diffraction limited imaging. So what we're doing here is we're simplifying information, but we're doing that by taking a penalty and the penalty is time. We're spreading information in, uh, around in time so that we can more precisely understand what content actually exists there. But it's really powerful, right? Uh, and what you can get with that is that you can actually increase the resolutions on a microscope by tenfold or so. 
to give you a, a better sense of, of this, uh, here's one of my favorite cells, uh, a lymphocyte, where we're preempting it to form uh, an immunological synapse. And I'm just trying to understand if there's two proteins that are potentially interacting with each other. Uh, green is flat, uh, red is SWIP76. And I know that once we activate TCR, they form a complex. Uh, and now I'm just trying to really understand where that complex can be at the surface of the membrane of this cell. And canonically, what you'd go is, let's where, look where we have yellow, uh, right? Green over red, that gives you yellow. That's where you get to cold colorization. Um, so it feels like these guys are all over the membrane, right? Uh, but the image that I'm showing you is it's conventional turf, right? And uh, it's with a 300 nanometer resolution, which is what the best you can get without applying a super resolution. And now I'm just going to convert this image into a, a single molecularization microscopy image. And you see a completely different story because these um, uh, proteins actually seem to form some, some clusters or nanoscale territories within the surface of the cell, but these are almost mutually exclusive. They're, they're proximal to each other, but those uh, molecules with some very small uh, uh, um, variations almost seem to, to not interact with each other uh, at all. And that's, that's really interesting because it starts giving you a sense of why super resolution might be interesting. Because on the conventional microscope, if you're resolution limited to about 300 nanometers and you're trying to understand how molecules interact with each other, and most proteins, don't forget, they're, they're, they range from two to 15 nanometers in size or so. So that's the same saying that's, uh, that's saying that you have a technique with a resolution as big as an auditorium to try to understand if two people are sitting next to each other. And the error is the auditorium itself. And, and techniques like single molecularization microscopy, they're really cool because they reduce your error to about 20 nanometers or so. But it's still not the scale of those proteins themselves, right? It's just improved a lot in the accuracy to which we observe uh, some of these territories, but we're not there yet. It's just, it's a significant improvement, uh, but there's so much to be done still. So that's, that's what I did during my PhD. Uh, during my PhD, I really wanted to improve the way that we did single molecule gazette microscopy, and I developed a few algorithms to uh, help do this. And I also improved a, a little bit the way that we could um, resolve, uh, for example, signaling uh, molecules at the surface of cells. And then I started um, my postdoc and my research as group leader. And, and pretty much what I thought is, cool, their super resolution, what can we use it? What is it that we've never seen before? And, and you know, there's a lot of things that you can't really accurately look at with conventional forensic microscopy. My favorite one is viruses. It happens that the biggest mammalian infecting virus, which is pox, it's still about 300 to 400 nanometers in width. So the biggest virus you can find to infect in a, a human cell is not resolvable by a normal microscope. So, so that means that almost any infection study that you want to do with, with small pathogens such as viruses, or if you want to look at super micro complexes, super resolution should be great to, to look at them, right? It starts giving you a resolution at the scales of those objects. And to give you a sense of this, I'm going to show you a bit of research that I've done. Uh, in this case, for example, I'm going to show you a little bit of what we can do uh, by applying super solution to observe HIV. And one of the things that uh, we can actually uh, observe is uh, capsidin coating. Uh, HIV, let's see if my mouse appears. Up, up, up. Hold on. Let me see where my mouse is. There you go. Does it appear? No. I'll walk you through. Um, HIV has a capsid inside that looks a little bit like a, an ice cream uh, cone. And uh, that capsid actually has to uncoat in order for the viral genome uh, to be carried and integrated into the host genome. Um, so for example, with super social microscopy, we can actually uh, resolve that capsidinal coating, which means that we can very clearly see the early stages of viral infection and how they progress. 
And we the, the same kind of structures can be observed with YAM, but the benefits that we have here with supersolution is that we can even see capsid net coating within living cells, which means that we get to see a glimpse of the dynamics of this process. Um, and it's really cool. The image that you see on the top right um, is um, integrase, which is a component of the virus. It's, it's responsible for carrying the viral genome into uh, the interior um, of the cell. And you see this, this beautiful superposition image on the right where you see um, this halo of the nucleus with some, it looks like sun explosions. And, and the halo of the nucleus, what you have there is actually the inner envelope of the, of the nucleus of the cell where integrase accumulates and it's ready to start uh, making double strand breaks to actually science. Sorry, it can start making double strand breaks to actually start integrating the, the viral uh, genome. And it's great because now we're at a stage where you know you, we can start super solving viruses in many of the stages of infection from the moment that the virus touches the cell and starts engaging with the receptors that it needs to get inside to, to uh, features such as, for example, uncoating. And HIV is, is interesting. It's, it's 120 nanometers. Um, it's really below what you could uh, see with a conventional um, microscope. But you can start getting substructure out of it with, with super solution. Let me show you a bigger one. So this is pox. As I was telling you, uh, I think of all known mammalian infection viruses, it's the biggest one. Uh, and it's just a dot on, on a normal microscope. Uh, but even with techniques such as structural illumination microscopy, you can start already getting a little bit of structure uh, out of it. And one of the first tools that we've developed as a lab is actually a, uh, an algorithm called Virus Mapper. And Virus Mapper, what it allows you to do is, for example, if you have uh, extracellular viruses that have uh, a metastable uh, structure, which means that structure is repetitive, uh, the algorithm can uh, dynamically identify those viruses and start doing a single particle analysis on them, which means that it can create an average model of how the virus looks like in full three uh, dimensions and start uh, positioning and mapping where proteins are within the virus uh, itself. We've uh, also, we can also correlate this with um, EM information, obviously, getting you the benefit of Francis microscopy, where you know the protein uh, or the molecule identity that you're observing. And with EM, you get uh, a little bit more detail on the substructure that might exist there. And of course, the benefit here is that uh, we can start taking these observations uh, in cells and, and see how the virus actually changes its, its, um, its morphology as it undergoes uncoating or morphogenesis. One of the things that we've been able to do with this is, for example, discover that the fusion machinery of the virus that you're seeing here is actually polarized to the tips of the virus. <laughs> Okay, so that's a little bit of what we can do with super solution and some of the, the uh, new uh, observations that we've uh, been able to do. Um, and with that, for example, we've created Virus Mapper, which is a great piece of software if you want to look uh, and uh, analyze repetitive structures that appear um, in cells uh, observed by super solution microscopy. But one of the things that we also want to do is to try to develop uh, new probes for single molecule localization microscopy. So I'm going to briefly tell you what we've done in that direction. So one of the interesting things is that uh, most uh, methods based on single molecule localization microscopy will depend on proof wars that will turn on and off in a light mediated manner. What that means is that first you need a microscope with considerable illumination intensity, really powerful lasers to, to induce those changes in states. And, and it also means that from microscope to microscope, uh, because you're going to have slightly different lasers, slightly different illuminations, you are going to get different photokinetics on, on those flow force. So we were curious about the idea of maybe try, seeing if it was possible to generate probes that would naturally photo switch in a way that is fairly independent of the illumination itself. And here's what we came up with. Uh, what you're seeing there is a DNA airpin. On that DNA airpin, on the ends, we have a quencher, and the other end, we have a through four. And when we have the airpin configuration, the through four and the quencher are forced to be together. 
and that silences the flow for. It silences the flow for because due to collisional quenching, uh, you, the, the absorption spectra of and emission spectra of the flow for is actually shifted. So it's not compatible with the conventional illuminations that you would normally have. But if this airpin structure actually uh, melts of the throw four and uh, quencher away from each other, the throw four is uh, free to start emitting light again. And the interesting thing is that uh, due to the uh, thermodynamics that you have on the microscope and the normal sample chamber and the, the microenvironment where the probe is, you can actually design an airpin structure where naturally the, uh, that probe will be constantly switching between an off state and an on state by just constantly opening and closing and opening and closing. And it's, this can be controlled by temperature, by the, the buffer conditions, uh, meaning, for example, the salts that you have, uh, and the, the beacon structure itself. So, so cool. Here, here's a probe that switches on and off in a way that is purely mechanical, right? Um, and the way that we started characterizing this is we started putting them on cover slips where uh, these cover slips are coated with strapped evidence. The probes have a small biotin motif, which means they are stuck into, the, stuck into these cover slips. And, uh, and here's some of the imaging that we get. Um, these are the probes just naturally blinking. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add formamide in a few seconds. It's going to force the probes to open, which is what you're seeing here. And you suddenly force probes going from a switching state to a completely on state and then they just switch out after a few seconds. Here we go. I'm going to add formamide again. We add it, probes open, constantly emit. Before adding the formamide, there's just photo switching. And that photo switching is mostly independent of the illumination that you put on the microscope. Um, and here's the traces for, for three probes that um, we, you know, we've selected just to give you a, a sense of what's going on. So this is really cool because um, not only do they photo switch, they're also fairly protected for um, from photo bleaching. And that's because it's due to the fact that once the probe uh, is on a closed state and it's being quenched, uh, that through four is not absorbing light anymore. And also we believe that uh, the present the equation of quenching that you have with the quencher also induces the through fours that are on triplet states to go back uh, into ground state also. So we, we started uh, using them for super solutions. Uh, we are still trying to figure out how to put them in, in cells in uh, an, an, a more natural and uh, manner that will not elicit, for example, an innate immune response from cells because cells hate having double-stranded uh, DNA in them. Uh, they think these viruses that, <laughs> that are infecting. Um, but we're getting there. And I think there's an enormous, enormous potential for, for this product uh, in super-resolution microscopy. So, uh, so I told you a little bit about viruses and, and some of the probes that we are developing. Uh, I want to go back to, to tell you about um, a small story. So I started the lab in 2013, uh, and as a new PI, one of the first things that you always try to do is you happily start uh, writing grants with some of your ideas and the directions you want to take. And I want to show you some of the feedback uh, I had at that time. So from Human Frontiers, this would be a great project for CryoEM. From the MRC, which is one of the biggest medical councils in the UK, super resolution in general should be seen at, at face value as a sophisticated way of analyzing blobs that can only be complementary to high resolution EM. Um, so there's some rough criticism there, and, and obviously I was incredibly annoyed by this um, at the beginning. But one of the reasons why it's so annoying is that there's, there's quite a bit of truth there also. The fact is, um, the scales that I'm showing you, I've, I've been putting electron microscopy underneath it for, uh, uh, for a long time. And, and the fact is, electron microscopy is able to easily get the scales that we're trying to achieve with super resolution. Furthermore, if you ask me uh, what novel structures 
have the microscopy fields been able to identify in super resolution that had not been seen by EM before, I will struggle to tell you about something new. Most of it we actually have observed with EM before. So why would you use super resolution? One of the easy answers is you get micro identity, right? Which comes from presence. You know exactly what you're looking at. But perhaps bigger than that is that super resolution microscopy has the potential to be life cell compatible. And that's impossible to do with EM. So it's not necessarily that we're going to see something new that we never saw before. It's more the fact that we now have the capacity to see the behavior of those structures that were discovered by EM. So this criticism actually uh, was quite useful because uh, what we wanted to do after this was to dedicate a considerable portion of our focusing research to develop methods that were live cell compatible, uh, particularly on the super resolution fields. But there's a little bit of a challenge here, right? I told you about palm storm, uh, single molecule causation microscopy, uh, which is uh, my realm of favorite super resolution methods. They give you resolutions down to 20 nanometers or so, but they're really phototoxic to cells. And that's because we generally need to impose kilowatts per square centimeter of illumination into cells to generate that kind of photo switching that you normally see. And it takes minutes to hours to acquire uh, a single individual image. So, so we still have a little bit of a problem here. And the methods like SIM, for example, they're great. They're really much more live cell compatible than uh, perhaps other super resolution approaches, but they're still limited to about twice the resolution, uh, an improvement of twofold in resolution. There are ways to get SIM beyond that, but those ways will start generating, again, increasing amounts of uh, photo uh, bleaching and phototoxicity into your uh, sample. Okay, so we wanted to, to see if we could do something to improve on this area. Um, and this is the challenge that we have, right? Uh, I really like palm storm single molecule causation microscopy methods, and I want to make them more or less compatible. And this is the typical data sets that we deal with, right? We, we blast cells with light to a point where we see individual molecules blinking, allowing us to pinpoint where they are in space and therefore creates a, a, a map of where we have found them. But can I do this much faster using much less illumination? And that's what we've tried to do uh, while developing a new super resolution method that we call SURF. So, so briefly telling you how SURF works. What you're seeing here is uh, an acquisition that we've done of 100 frames, and these frames were acquired at high speed, so 100 frames per second. We're using 40 milliwatts per square centimeter. So an illumination that is similar to what you would use on an epifluorescence microscope with a lamp, for example. So it's at really low illuminations, uh, you're really at the point where cells will be okay for a few minutes uh, without uh, considerable bleaching or damage. And what SURF tries to do is, um, it first assumes that the through force that you have there are oscillating their intensity. And they are. In reality, every through force oscillates their intensity because there is no such thing as a perfect through force. You're all, even with GFP, you're going to get collisional quenching with oxygen. You're going to have instability in the structure. You're going to have almost threat. There's a whole set of reasons why you never get a constant uh, photon flux over time. So that means that from, from time to time, you're going to get likely through force that slightly emits their intensity brighter than any other through force in their vicinity. And if they do so, they will present a shape that is slightly radially symmetric. And the reason why it's going to be radially symmetric, it goes back to one of my first slides, right? Where we're using a circular aperture on your objectives, which means that every point source of light will get this radially symmetric profile, the PSF. And therefore, if you have a through force that it's brighter, that shape is going to come out. So SURF, the first thing they try to do is actually map regions of space that have a high degree of radial symmetry. Uh, and that's a simple mathematical operation that we can apply. And if we apply that 
mathematical operation, here, here's what we get, right? And the interesting thing here is now that uh, from that data set that you see on the left, you start seeing blinking on the right. And the blinking is just really the region of space that have that, that higher degree of radial symmetry. But interestingly enough, even backgrounds, uh, ah, I think you can see my mouse, even, even for these um, region here that doesn't seem to be, have any proof for, there is some degree of radial symmetry existing there. And, and that's expected, right? Because even noise will have uh, completely random patterns uh, that can from time to time present a little bit of radial symmetry, and therefore the algorithm is able to, to pick it up. So the question is, how can I distinguish oscillations that actually come from full force from oscillations that do not come from full force and are uh, simply generated by noise? Well, one thing that is interesting here is that noise is uncorrelated in time. What I mean with that is that the signal that you get on a noisy pixel has very little to do with the signal that you're going to get for the same pixel in the next time point. But the signal that you actually get on oscillations of through force have a correlation to themselves. That means that through force have a pattern to the way that they oscillate their intensities. So if we just start asking where in time do we actually get regional space that have some correlation in their signal in time versus one that don't, and if I apply those correlations, what I get is actually the structure which I'm trying to super resolve. So that's the basis of SURF, right? Two components, one which is calculating radial symmetry on, on the sample, and the other ones which is trying to find temporal correlations in the way that you get oscillations on those uh, radial symmetries. There is something that you need to be a little bit aware here also, which is what you're seeing here on the right, it's a super social representation of the structures that you have on the left, great. Um, they definitely have higher resolution than what you see on the left, but they represent something completely different. What I mean with that is, while structure is well represented, signal likely is not. Because think about what is signal here on the movie on the left. The signal that you get on a pixel corresponds to the number of photons that were locally detected. And the higher the stoichiometry of rule force you have, the likelihood, the higher the likelihood that you get a brighter signal. So in the Francis image, you can almost say that brighter signal, more through force. On the surf image, the, the signal that you get on a pixel corresponds to actually the capacity of the algorithm to pick up uh, the oscillations on a radio symmetric object. So it's related to the capacity of the proof of the algorithm to guess there's a proof for there more than the number of proof for that you have. So that means that the super resolution image that you see on the right is not necessarily linear in intensity to what you have on the left. And you might think, that's crazy, Ricardo. Uh, but the thing is, that's true for almost every super resolution method you ever try, except the pure optical ones, where pure optical is, for example, instant sim or every scan um, before you deconvolve that data. All right, so why? what is SURF good for? Uh, well, if you have a very dead and fixed sample, you don't care about SURF. It's just a palm storm. Take half an hour to, to recover back that uh, that's, uh, image. You're going to get a, a great image out of it. But for a living sample, using, for example, 10,000 fold less illumination than what you would use for palm storm, single molecule coexistence microscopy, you get something like this, which has a uh, uh, a conserved uh, resolution improvement. It's it's you're not getting 20 nanometers as you would get with palm storm and blasting the cell, but you do get a resolution improvement. In this case, we've calculated it, it's about threefold uh, improvement. But the beauty of it is that you know, it's a living cell. We're continuously imaging it for 30 minutes. It doesn't stop. There is no visual uh, effects of it um, uh, being bleached or damaged uh, by light. So. It's a pure mathematical method for super resolutions that actually works on most microscopes as long as you obey some basic rules. And it's really meant to be able to allow you to look at uh, living samples. 
Right. So if you want to see where we used um, uh, surf recently, there's a couple of papers um, we published where we did flower scope findings using the algorithm. Um, check it out in case you want to uh, see what it's able to do. And also, we're uh, well. Roman is the one doing this. Uh, we're developing um, a new version of Surf that we call Live Surf, uh, and the new version of Surf improves a little bit the quality on the reconstructions that it generates, uh, allowing you to get a little bit higher resolution and better data uh, out of your samples. And the nice thing is that it's been optimized to, to work in uh, a large number of different microscopes, including spinning disks and like cheat uh, microscopes. For example, the, the image that you see on the bottom right is with a lattice white sheet um, system. All right, so I've made you a great pitch for web cell imaging, right? But uh, there is of what you can do with a fixed sample. Um, and I always wondered, how how can I go back and get the resolutions that I would get with a fixed sample and, and using synthetic dyes and antibodies? How can we bring that to, to web cell imaging? And the simple answer is you can't, but you can combine both. You can watch your sample both live and fixed. And how do you do that? Well. You fix the sample on the microscope as you image. That means that uh, up to a certain moment, you get live cell dynamics, and upon fixation, you get the chance to take three hours to super resolve a single time point, right? So the way that we try to implement this in a way that is useful to us and accessible to everyone was by actually develop pumpy pump, pump, pump face that you're seeing here. We've done it in collaboration with um, the Christophe Wetterie lab in, uh, in Marseille. So pumpy is pretty much a strange pump array built in Lego. Uh, it's really simple to build. <laughs> a 14 year old uh, kid could build it. Um, it uses um, uh, Arduinos to, to control the Lego motors and it's really inexpensive. Um, and what it's able to do is the typical protocol you would do on a web bench uh, in terms of immunostaining, for example, a sample, it's able to do it on a microscope. And, and it's actually not a hard task because if you think about what you're doing in, in the dish, you're literally just doing liquid exchange, right? You're uh, adding PFA, washing with, uh, uh, with a buffer, uh, adding your antibodies, washing, adding, washing, and doing that, you're just swapping the liquids that you have there. Pumpy is doing exactly just that, right? It's all doing all the washing and all the additions of reagents that you need. Um, and also because it's Lego, it's it's really pliable. For example, what you're seeing there is uh, an array of pumps, but we have one individualized pump that is actually inside the incubator, uh, just next to the sample chamber. And that's because that's the one with PFA. The, the PFA is kept at 37 degrees by being within the incubator. And it's just there to, to fix the sample uh, whenever it's needed. So it, it might look a little bit like, like a toy, but it's a really powerful toy. And let me show you what you can do with such a toy. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of experiments that we've done. The first one is we're going to switch between live to fixed cell imaging. Um, the live cell imaging, what I'm showing you here, it's a U2 OS cell that uh, we're uh, expressing uh, a marker uh, for actins uh, with GFP. And I'm just going to show you turf first, and then I'm going to improve slightly the resolution using surf. So here we go. This is just surf. Now we're switching into surf. Surf again improves the resolution a little bit, not massive, because the massive comes now. Because what you're seeing now is the, the cell post fixation. And there we switch into maybe 30 nanometers resolution or so. So that means that now we have all the temporal dynamics on that actin cortex prior to the fixation. And we have a massive resolution improvement once we fix the cell. Now that we have the fixed cell, what we can do, and because we have that strange pump array, is we can actually label for a protein, strip out that label, label for a different protein, strip out, label, strip out, label, strip out, label, strip out, which means that now we are theoretically unlimited in the number of different proteins that we could actually see decorating that cell. 
there is effectively is in practice a limitation, right? Every time we are changing uh, the liquid environment of the cell, there is a mechanical stress that we have are imposing to the cell, although it's a fixed cell. Uh, but, the, you know, in, we've been able to carry out about 10 different rounds of labeling um, for for uh, for our samples uh, without major issues, and there's labs that have been able to do 30 plus uh, without major issues. And the, the fun thing here is that, you know, Pump is fully automated. So the data sets that you saw were acquired with no one in front of the microscope it's it although it takes hours it's it's fully robotized at the end and it's robotized by label um so how fun is that um so as i was saying in the beginning of my talk everything is meant to be really transferable and reproducible so so give it a try and and quite a bit of researchers out there built their own versions of pumpy and they're happily using it um, in their labs Right, so that's some of the tech we've been uh, creating for supervision. Um, now it's the part of my talk where I ask you, do you believe me? And your answer should be not completely recurring. And, and you shouldn't, uh, because the fact is um, the techniques that we're using here, they are prone to defects and, and artifacts. And, and that's true for the great majority of the resolution methods you might ever used. And we've tried to deal with this a little bit. And, and one of the ways that we've tried to deal with this is by actually creating algorithms that are able to identify some of the defects you might have in your data. One of the algorithms that we created is called Squirrel. So how does Squirrel work? So let's think a little bit about image formation for, for a second. Um, when you go to a microscope, you're able to acquire a diffraction limited image. That's the canonical image you, you get out of there. It's, it's kind of your simplest uh, possible step. And, and you know that that diffraction limited image should correspond or should be representing some kind of labeled underlying structure you see on the microscope. It's just that it's, it's highly blurred by the optics of the microscope. And you can then actually try to acquire supersolution image by an optical technique, single molecule acquisition microscopy, SIM, STEDS, anything else. And what's your supersolution image there? Well, your supersolution image is your best guess of what that labeled structure is. And, and if that's a good guess, that means that if I apply a resolution loss function to it, I'm going to get something that is very similar to my diffraction limited image. But in, in fact, my super resolution image has defects in it. When I apply my resolution loss function, I'm going to get a diffraction limited equivalent, which also carries on those defects, which means it's not really similar anymore to what I would get or to what I get on the microscope. And, and that's the basis for comparison, right? Uh, so Squirrel algorithm effectively, what it does is it asks you two images, a, a reference, which is your diffraction limited image and a super resolution image. It aligns the two, finds what's the resolution loss function that it needs to apply, applies it, compares the reference image against your diffraction limit equivalent from the super resolution and generates an error map from it. That error map shows you where there's problems with your data and even gives you a global metric of uh, how good the data is or not. Sounds complicated, but it's really just that. Two images, the reference and the super resolution. And that's it. It will estimate the, the resolution scaling function and generate an error map for you. Why is this interesting and why is this um, important? Well, here's uh, what I would call a gorgeous uh, superposition image. Um, by eye, I would have trouble to find any problems with it. Um, and, and you know, this image actually comes from one of the best superposition microscopists in the world, Christophe Wittry. He's, he's, he's the master at it, right? And, and generally what you get on to see on papers is something similar to this, a white field image next to a super resolution image. And when authors do that, they intend to, to give you two messages, a little bit hidden messages, notwithstanding. One is the first message is, look how cool my super resolution image is compared to the white field. 
The second message is, trust me, what you're seeing is real because the superposition image is similar to the white field image, right? So you, you see the same structures, it's just one has much higher resolution. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create an error map uh, comparing these two. And error map actually shows that, well, it's not whole perfect. There's actually problems in the data. And, and when you start seeing where it actually um, uh, has the, those problems, is for example, where it starts having quite a bit of structures overlapping with each other, which the single molecule algorithms have trouble uh, localizing from force when there's too much information there. And there's even a little bit of the number three is the, the, one of my favorite ones where you actually have web, uh, antibody webbing that probably stripped out on the sample during the acquisition, which means it's not there anymore, but it actually existed on the first diffraction limited image that you you acquired. Cool. So you shouldn't be afraid of calculating these error maps, right? So what they tell you is first, what's the quality of your data? And there is no such thing as a perfect uh, data set, but it also shows you that locally there's areas where you can trust more or trust less. And, and this goes a little bit in the direction of also trying to battle a little bit of a dogma that we have in the superposition fields. Because what happens in most superposition papers is that um, authors will use a resolution value as a statement of quality. So for example, I could have just showed you that superposition image that you see on, on the left and told you that's a great image, you have 20 nanometers resolution. And that would be your take-home message. And you probably would think 20 nanometers, that's really, it sounds really good, the image looks great, great that the set recovery. But resolution and quality, they're not actually the same thing. You can have uh, a really small scale artifacts, which is 20 nanometers in size, but an artifact nonetheless. Um, so we have to decouple these two concepts. And we also have to decouple the concept that resolution is homogeneous throughout the field of view, because it's not. And what you're seeing here is I'm creating a resolution map of my data set. Most authors, what they'll try to do, and we're guilty of this, of doing that in the past also, by the way, uh, they will cherry pick the, the, an area which really allows them to, to uh, show you a, a great resolution value that they're actually achieving. So, so they'll generally give you the, the minima that they're able to achieve from that data. But that's actually not necessarily representative of the overall resolution that you have uh, uh, there. And, and look, resolution will change. Resolution is not homogeneous. Definitely in single molecule microscopy, it's not homogeneous in SURF. Um, it's not homogeneous in SIM. Uh, and instead, it highly depends on your through force and your laser alignments across the sample. So something that we always have to keep in mind independently of the method that we're using. Right, so I think uh, I'm changing paces a little bit and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that we've been uh, doing with machine learning. I think likely Guillaume has given you a talk some, some months ago around this, um, uh, because this is a project that we very much are doing uh, with the Guillaume Jacquemet lab in, in Truco. So, so uh, machine learning is really booming right now in the microscopy fields. And the last two years, uh, uh, there's been tens to hundreds of different algorithms. And it has been really revolutionizing the way that we extract information from microscopy data. And we've been particularly interested in, in it because of this, right? So one of the key aspects where uh, it's very clear that um, neural nets do a great work at is the noising data. Um, and the noising data means that we can actually image sample, weaving samples with less illumination, allowing them to behave more naturally and to, to image them for, for longer. <laughs> But the question is, how can we actually apply this to the lab? Or how can we actually make it more accessible to, to everyone? So why is that a problem? Let me show you a little bit about the workflow that you normally have to do to use deep learning in microscopy. Normally, if you wanted, for example, to do a task like denoising or, uh, or generating a super-resolution image, Classically, what you would actually do is you would have an input image and a predefined algorithm that tries to do something on that image. In this case, just the noise, right? And that predefined algorithm is it's taking a lot of assumptions that you as the developer of the algorithm or user of the algorithm 
are putting into its bats to generate that um, uh, that the noise image. So that means that you know it's a filter that is already for moist. You put in something into the filter and it gets you something out. A deep learning machine learning algorithm does something slightly different. What it happens is that it's it's a filter that is not defined yet. And you start that filter by actually showing it examples of, uh, for, for this case, a noisy image and the corresponding non-noisy noisy image. And that's easy to use, to do, by the way, because you can actually go to a microscope and acquire two images for the same sample, one with long exposure, one with short exposure, or one with high illumination, one with low illumination. So you can easily get examples of, of high noise, low noise images. And you present this to a, a neural network. And the neural network, what it's going to try to do is trying to find ways to mathematically translate one type of image to the other. And if you show it hundreds to thousands of examples, at some point in the neural network, you will say, I think I found some of the rules that will translate these images into the other. So at that point, you actually have a trained neural network, which means you can give it an input image and it will predict what would be your denoised image at the end. So that means that your deep learning algorithm needs two things. It needs a training session, and the training session needs a huge amount of example data. And then it has a prediction session, which is it already has been trained, then you can just give it a data set and it's going to predict how to denoise that data set. And, and I'm giving you the noise in the example, but there's many different tasks it could be. It could be segmentation, it could be super resolution uh, estimation, um, so forth. Now, one of the problems here is that you always need that training data. That, that's on you. There's no way to simplify it. You always have to acquire it. But also, the training itself, in terms of algorithms, actually requires really advanced computational power. And that's really expensive GPUs at the end of, uh, of the day. So we created a platform called Zero Cost Deep Learning for Microscopy. And what this platform actually does is it takes advantage of pre-existing free called um, uh, uh, capacity provided by Google. So, so effectively, zero cost deep learning for microscopy allows you to easily explore uh, free resources that exist on the cloud to do the training and inference and run some of these algorithms. How does it work? Well, the only thing that you need is actually a computer with a browser. Uh, all the calculations are going to do, be done on the cloud. So even that computer doesn't need to have anything special attached to it. And obviously, you also need some training data and some data that you want to use to, to then get some results of the, the neural network. So zero cost deep learning for microscopy simplifies the entire process that you're going to see next because what you will need to do is actually move that data into Google Drive, grab one of the notebooks that we've created for you. Those notebooks uh, are Google Collab, Jupyter Lab notebooks, but effectively they're just an interface that we've created. Uh, you're not exposed to any code unless you want to, and, and really it's it's meant for make it super easy for uh, a non-expert. Uh, with background in biology to, to be able to train and use a neural network. Those notebooks directly communicate with Google Collab to then ask uh, the resources in Google Collab to train the neural network and to start making predictions with the neural network. And once this is done, you're able then to download the train network and the results that you have. If this sounds confusing, uh, from our experience, someone that never used a neural network, if they try to use zero cost, it takes them about two hours to, to, to uh, figure it out and start actually training on their data. So give it a try. We, we actually have, uh, created it to, to, have, to generate a free quality based access to, to GPU, to really have simple user interfaces for, for researchers uh, to start doing and using uh, neural networks with no coding experience. And it's a really s a single platform for training, prediction, and quality control. So here are some of the tasks you, you can do with it. Uh, I'm going to give you a few examples. Uh, and all the names that you're seeing there is actually neural networks that we've implemented to work with zero cost. 
uh, UNETs, for example, which are uh, currently one of the biggest gold standards for classification of data, classifying EM data, as you saw before. Stardist, which is great at uh, nuclear segmentation. Um, some of the data from, from Guillaume uh, that uh, they also use uh, for tracking. Uh, YOLO, which is great at semantic classification. So it's able to, to classify phenotypes that you have um, in your data. Noise to voice, which uh, the noise is data. Uh, this is one of the, the easiest networks to train. Um, care, uh, perhaps the most notorious uh, data uh, network to restore the data that you are acquiring in a microscope. DeepStorm, which tries uh, to do a single molecule causation microscopy on your data. FNET that predicts fluorescence images from just bright field uh, images. In that case, you were looking at mitochondria, pix to pix, where uh, we're actually predicting, predicting where the nucleus of cells are just by showing it an, an acting uh, channel. And cyclogans, in this case, we're also using it to, to generate a super resolution image prediction. Good. So give a try to, to zero costs. Uh, again, <laughs> it's been massively now used uh, by the community and we're uh, adding new features to it and new tasks um, every day. All right, that's a little bit of what I wanted to tell you. I'm going to, to wrap things up by um, ending with, with a message. This RI, RI sucks. We, we actually evolved with with the you know with the architecture of this organ slightly incorrectly designed. We have all these vasculature that you see here in front of the optical nerve, and and it actually degrades the quality that we have uh, in our vision. And and hey, we even have a blind spot um, in in your eyes. So. The problem here is that we're, we're, we're stuck with it. You know, there, there's not going to be a single gene mutation that is going to fix the architecture of our eye. In terms of evolution, that's it. That, I don't think there's going to be major changes or improvements to what you have there. But the thing is, you don't really realize the problems you have with your eyes because your visual cortex fixes most of the problems that you have. And that's amazing, right? Uh, uh, and, and if you really don't realize to the level that the, your visual cortex does this, there's an easy test you can do. Get drunk. If you get drunk, you're going to see much of the higher level processing that you have on your visual cortex just going down. Guess what's the first thing that you, you, you get when you start getting drunk? Double vision, right? So double vision is the registration that you have of the images between both your eyes. It's gone. You're not able to register those, those two images anymore. So you actually get the two uh, images from, from, from the eye and um, get a little bit more drunk. And actually, your eyes are going to start, um, the, uh, the images that you get from your eyes is going to start wobbling and rotating without your head even doing that. And that's because your vision is actually aligned with the gravity axis. And there starts to be a disconnection with, between your internal ear that gives you the information about that gravity axis and the image that you get from your eyes. And that's the reason why you, when you have your phone, when you rotate the camera, the, the, your phone like this, you see your pictures going and, and wobbling. But if you rotate your head like this, actually your vision is always aligned with the gravity axis. And you know, it, the, the amount of processing power you get is really amazing. One of the last things that you start uh, losing once you get drunk is you start seeing that blind spot. There's going to be a big black dot appearing on your vision because that's real. It does exist. It just happens that your brain infers the missing data that exists there. And uh, if, if you are a little bit like me and you don't drink that much, uh, one easy one they can easily do is just move your eyes slightly. And as you push your eye up, you're going to see that your vision, your image is actually going to go down. And that's because your brain flips the image that you get from your eyes. So as you push down, you actually get the flip image. As you push up, you actually get the flip image going up, which gives you the impression that actually it's going down. 
And we're actually at the same stage with, with optics. The, the thing is, look, there hasn't really been any disruptive change in the way that we exploit the physics of glass to create objectives in the last 80 years or so. Um, you, you might say that, you know, th that there's really uh, high, a big field, high NA objectives now. But I, I don't think it's really that disruptive at the end of the day. I think we're, we, we're at the maximum of what we can do with the physics of glass and with the physics of materials that we can push. There are some interesting things that might happen with metal lenses in the future, but we've been stuck for a few decades. But where things are really incredible now is how we actually use computational resources to extract more out of that physics limited information that we got out of a microscope. And that's amazing in my mind because it's very much the, the stage that we are as, as beings with our uh, visual cortex. It's what we're getting to in biology with computers next to microscopes. And with that, uh, I wanted to just uh, make a little bit of advertisement focal point, check it out. It's um, a community resource uh, for microscopists and, and for cell biologists to get together and have chats. Um, it's doing some, some amazing work in terms of uh, promoting microscopy in cell biology, particularly. And I also wanted to thank every one of you too for listening, the lab funding, and we're also hiring uh, as we created a new app in Portugal. We're always looking for postdocs and interesting uh, PhD students to, to join us now. All right, that's it. I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you, Ricardo, for this uh, fantastic talk. Very um, inspiring and thought-provoking. Um, yeah, even if we're a little bit over time, I think we'll take um, a few minutes to, to for some questions. Um, does anybody have any questions? Uh, Davida, I see you raised your hand. Please go ahead. Okay. So, um... Ricardo, thank you very much. Actually, it was really cool. Um, so I have two questions. So the first question is related with the acquisition of 3D data and SURF. So the um, so the fact is that with SURF you need like this like really. Um, Gabby, is something you want to say? <laughs> okay. So it's so because the the fact is that I'm, I'm wondering you were you were applying SURF on like lattice light sheet. And there is a Z scanning there. And then how it's compatible with Z scanning, so the sweeping through the sample, and then the need of acquiring like, uh, like fast fluctuations uh, on the same planes of the fluorophores to do this like uh, a reconstruction, right? And my second question is regarding Squirrel the plugin, because I was wondering whether like it was it would be possible to actually compare two images that are not like a um, super resolution, super resolved image and like a white field image or whatever, like a not super resolved image, but actually two different techniques of acquisition. For example, confocal and line sheet to see where the artifacts of like z different Z resolution, things like this, like thickness of the line sheet they are. So please, if you could elaborate on them. Yes. So um, for the first part, um, so a little bit of information that also I, I didn't give, which is uh, currently surf only improves resolution into the, and that's one of the reasons why it's really, why we're trying to push it to work with light sheet also, uh, because then we benefit from the the, uh, the resolution improvement in Z from the light sheet, and then the resolution improvement in XY from, from surf. So for the uh, for the case of light sheets that have featured uh, acquisitions, uh, which is some of the data for, for the lattice, for example, um, the nice thing is that that's deterred acquisitions. The, the, the deterring is so fast for the exposure time of the camera um, that we don't, and the, the, the correlations that you have from the deterring don't really pass through in a significant manner to, to serve. So we, it's not really one of the problems that we get at the end of the day. Uh, we get a few problems. One of the major ones actually uh, is that um, for white sheets, mostly you dominantly get SMOS cameras, and SMOS cameras have uh, non homogeneous noise across the, the camera ship. Um, and we're still fighting to, to dampen that down, down with SURF. With the new version of SURF, it's going to be much better in terms of uh, patterns that come just from the shape of the camera. Um, but it's still a slightly uh, hard problem to, to solve. 
Um, fortunately, I think it's going to disappear because the, with the new generation of cameras that coming uh, soon, um, that's going to become less of um, a problem. But it's, it's a good question, uh, David. And, and you know, any method that imprints the patterns into the, the, the excitation, including spinning disk, has a chance to generate artificial patterns on SIR um, also. Now, to your second question, which is, could you compare two, two methods um, we're using Squirrel? Uh, yes, not once at this end, because so what we've done, for example, is compare superposition approaches. We, we've, uh, instead of using a diffraction limited reference image, we used a, another superposition approach uh, to cross validate each other. So we could compare SIM against uh, single molecule, uh, STEDS against SERP. Um, and what the squirrel is going to tell you is where you actually have uh, uh, unexpected variations between the, those two images. The thing is, we don't know, or the algorithm will not tell you where the artifact comes from, from which technique, because it might be that both methods have the possibility of creating defects. It just tells you that there's a defect there. So you still have to do a little bit of uh, detective work to try to figure out where, where it comes from. When you compare it against a diffraction limited image, we're still assuming that diffraction limited image is perfect. It might not be, but that's the assumption we normally do with Squirrel. Could you use it to, to compare um, confocal and um, an white sheet? I'd have to think a little bit about that. Squirrel only works in 2D right now. Uh, I, I think that's a question that would be much interesting to ask in 3D. Uh, but there's there's some potential to do it there, um, something to look at in the future, perhaps. All right. Thank you very much. Good. Great. Um, I think Gabi had raised his hand. Um, do you want to go ahead and ask? Yeah, again, sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I see other people raising hands, so I'm just going to say something. And I, because I'm very fortunate to have Ricardo now work at the same institute, and I can sit down and bullshit science and microscopy with him. So I'm going to let other people ask questions, but I just wanted to say this. And Ricardo, we're going to sit down on coffee and discuss why the human eye does super resolution in real time, and how that could apply to microscopes. I don't think there's enough time to discuss that here today. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Ricardo. <laughs> I, we, we just need to get a, a, a brain organized on the microscope to do all the processing for us. <laughs> all right. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, the, the, the human eye does less than 10 megapixels, and yet the visual system is capable of processing half a million megapixels in real time, which is quite amazing. And the way the, the way it does that is really interesting. I haven't seen it applied to microscopes. That was a really good point, Ricardo. Thanks, Ricardo. Um, and John, maybe? Thanks, Ricardo. Uh, great uh, presentation, very inspirational. Uh, you were all quite nicely elucidating the artifacts uh, in different situations. And of course, in the XY uh, direction, you get uh, truly astonishing results. And, and you also uh, checked quite carefully where you can have problems in that situation. But of course, we know that in the Z direction, uh, except for maybe IPALM, uh, we do have problems in, in terms of getting really high resolution and, uh, and super resolution. And then we resort to uh, various re reconstruction uh, strategies. How much of a problem do you see in terms of uh, artifact generation? when you go from, from 2D to 3D uh, with the techniques that we have available? Oh, that's, that's a great question, John. Um, the, at the end of the day, it's an enormous problem. And uh, the w most way that researchers try to fix it, including us, is by using you know skinny and anorexic cells. They're the cells that are almost 2D in nature. Um, because the thing is, the, the if you really get a thick sample uh, for, for a surfacing molecule, that just means more density that you get within the, the effective focal depths where those molecules might um, exist. Um, it, it, it works great with with filaments, for example, microtubules, right? Because also microtubules in, in, 
it's rare that they're perfectly aligned with the Z directions and, and their filaments, is, which means that they're mostly 1D structures. So even in the 3D environment, they're, they're a 1D problem to, to solve. But now if you have like a, a big fat um, uh, organelle, like a mitochondria aligned in any position in 3D, it becomes a much bigger challenge to solve. And by experience, because I do see the market loss, the, 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 the best way to, to try to tackle that is still to try to use some some um, some method that allows you some degree of optical sectioning. And most of the times we're, we're if not we're if we're not using turf, we're using high wall. But that still means that we're mostly at the surface. Um, many researchers have tried to do single molecule techniques with, with um, spinning disk, and, and I think there's some potential there. But the fact that you're still disregarding quite a bit of light into uh, such a system is a little bit of problematic in terms of constraining the maximum resolution you can get at the end of the day. But the thing is, even for SIM instead, this is a big problem. Uh, SIM, you know, there's going to be crosstalk uh, uh, of elimination that fringes as you go deeper into the sample. So it's really hard to do SIM on, on an embryo. Uh, and instead, Technically, it works, but also it's quite a bit of photo damaging technique. So, if you're raster scanning through your sample and using a considerable amount of the push and white, you're going to, as you're scanning it to the point, you're, you're pretty much destroying everything else in Z. So, so, at the end of the day, what we're all trying to, to move into is white sheets with supersolution. I think that's. That's the way to do it. It's just there are still big steps to 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 get there. But I think if anyone is interested in developing technology, that's probably one of the directions that you want to go and try and do. Thanks, Manjit. Do you want? Uh, I saw your hands. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Ricardo. Fantastic work. Uh, yeah. Very, very, very nice. Um, I was interested in the first part where you showed the viral receptors. And are you are you doing something on the SARS coronavirus too as well? Um, and I was wondering if the the techniques you developed could be used to find more receptors for SARS-CoV-2, which are happening to be more and slowly. The field is agreeing that it's not just ACE2. There are more and more coming. And I, I just wonder, because we also have been working on like and trying to find few receptors. So just wanted to know your interest in that. Uh... We're uh, we're definitely interested in viral entry, uh, and uh, the the problem here is that um, uh, super resolution is still um, a well throughput method. So that means that we won't necessarily be able to to go in a very naive way looking at a large number of different receptors in the cell. Uh, but once you have a subsection of hits, there are approaches such as DNA paint, which is a, a version of single molecule microscopy, that would allow you to to over a few hours to get 10 nanometer resolution or so for 10 or 20 receptors uh, and super resolve the virus also. So you could actually start super resolving what is the arrangements of a large number of different molecules that you've selected for uh, around the, the virus. And I think there's there's an enormous potential there. It is well to put, not, not be standing. We're talking about minutes to acquire images of a single uh, protein. Um, it has enormous potential to to validate a large screen not be sending, and, and that's something that we're always keen in having a look at. Yeah, that's great. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question in the chat from from Jan Petrasek. Um, Jan, do you want to unmute and ask your question yourself? Yes, yes, sorry, I tried to unmute. Great, Great lecture, Thanks. Ricardo, thank you very much. We are thank using you, your, your SRF, uh, formerly with EMC CD cameras, but I know it's, it now with the new new SCMOS cameras, it, it's really accessible. But I understood that perhaps the algorithm needs to be kind of optimized. But then I understood that it, it might be even used, the NanoJ, the ImageJ plugin, uh, if you have just back illuminated SCMOS. Is this true? Are you using it with just, you know, old NanoJ with the new cameras? Does it work? We, we have a new version of it that we've been... Okay. 
struggling struggling to get out for quite a long time now. Um, so so the, the 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 version that you have from 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 our public repositories right now is, is still the old version, which uh, uh, will get you some artificial patterning on the SCMOS cameras. Um, so so that means that the EMCC is still the best camera for that algorithm. Um, we we have an internal version uh, that mm -hmm. drop me an email mm -hmm. if you want to check it out. Thank uh, you. Which is much better for SEMOS there. It's mm. not mm. it's not a hundred percent there, mm. but uh, I would say it's noticeable by eye uh, that that you have still have patterning coming from uh, the ship. Perfect. The I will perhaps come back to you. I even realized that in the literature they use you know that all algorithm with new cameras and it's even published in, in in really very very decent journals and they say it works so i was like curious whether uh kind of uh, there is no need for a new algorithm but, but i would i would ask, i would that's perfect not if you have it so i will perhaps come back to you uh, and we can perhaps try thank you yeah definitely thank you pleasure mm -hmm. okay are there any more questions Somebody else wants to ask something? Okay, so I guess um, if that's not the case, then um, I want to thank Ricardo again for uh, this fantastic presentation, uh, super interesting work, and really I think a lot of things to, for all of us to, to think about. And yeah, with that, I would be at the end of um, the virtual pub. And I would just like to invite everyone to join us again next week, where we'll be hearing about um, Fluid FM, a new technology that we're showcasing at Eurobioimaging um, starting very soon. And yeah, with that, I wish you a nice uh, Friday afternoon and a nice weekend. I hope to see you next week. Thank you very much. Bye, Bye. everybody. Thank you. Thank you.